everyone. Um, we're continuing now with the session um, number three, actually, on uh, going global and saving money with that uh, by working with structured content and terminology and translation processes. Um, our guest today is Val Swisher and uh, the CEO of Content Rules, and uh, she will give the presentation today, and the stage is all yours, Val. Super. Thank you so much and uh, good morning everybody and thank you for joining me at the earlier time, no problem. Uh, my name is Val Swisher, I am the founder and CEO of Content Rules and today we're going to talk about going global. We're going to talk about how structured content saves time, saves money and improves quality with your global content. Just, this is my only slide advertisement for the company. <laughs> we are a content company here, Content Rules. Uh, we've been in business since 1994. We have a bunch of different focus areas, but they're all around content. So we combine content strategy, content optimization, and content development to maximize the effectiveness of your content and meet your business needs. I also want to say that we are uh, partners with the Rockley Group and we provide the Rockley method of uh, content strategy, unified content strategy. And for those of you who were on for the keynote and heard Andrew Bradenkamp, we are a uh, authorized reseller and service provider for the Acrowing software. So today was all of my people, as we say. So uh, if you need any help with your content strategy, with writing content, with optimizing content, please feel free to go to our website. Just so you know, we just launched a brand new website uh, this week. So uh, give it a peek, contentrules.com. So let's get to it. Today I'm going to talk about how you can improve your quality and save money on translation at the same time. It's uh, that better, cheaper, faster, trifecta that we're always looking for. And let's just talk about why this is important for a moment. So according to Common Sense Advisory, the translation market now is estimated to be at $40 billion. And that's a B, $40 billion. And according to Gala, it's growing at 65 to 7.5% per year. And according to the Chamber of Commerce in the United States, 95% of our consumers are outside of the U.S. So what we've seen over the past few years is more companies translating more content into more languages all the time. So it's really critical for us to be able to take our content and make those translations less expensive, faster to the marketplace, and of as high quality as possible. So there are three aspects to this that I'm going to discuss today, and I like to call this the holy trifecta. Uh, structured authoring with tools like FrameMaker, terminology management with tools like Acrolinks, and translation memory with tools like, oh, there's a whole bunch of tools that do translation memory. <laughs> As Andrew had said in his keynote, it, it's one plus two plus three. It's it, the sum of these three things is far greater than any individual part and even what you would think when you, when you combine them. Um, what I really want to get across today is structured authoring is great and you can save money in your translation process, you can improve your quality, etc. Terminology management by itself is also great, and translation memory by itself is also great, but when you align these three items, it's like a well-choreographed ballet. And I've been trying to evangelize this for a, a while, and I think as my customers uh, have matured in their content life cycle as they realize the translation cannot be an afterthought. It must be part of the development process. 
they've seen that when you really can integrate these, everything gets better. So let's first talk about structured authoring and translation and how this works and why. Here we have a monolithic document in an unstructured world. This is the way that historically we have created content. Everything from a letter to a 1,000 page reference guide and, and, and everything in between. We would start at page one and keep typing until page 322 and then we would be done. And that's this little pencil here. And of course, in between, you know, we went and sent it for review and the editor worked on it and, you know, we went back and forth. But for the most part, I have this, just this big blob of content and I would then send it to translation. That's my globe. And as a writer, as far as I'm concerned, I am done. That puppy is checked in. I am finished. Don't talk to me about that one. I've got 75 other 300 page documents after right now. But for the translation world, their job is just beginning. And what happens, and I, I have it as a double arrow, is that it's, the translation process is its own event. Translators work on the content. They send it out for its own review. Hopefully, every language has its own reviewer. And that reviewer is a native speaker of that language. Okay, so we often call them in-country reviewers, but it's, it doesn't have to be in the country, but for sure, it's someone who has that language as uh, their native language. And they iterate back and forth. So just imagine that. Imagine that we have 300 pages, and imagine that we are now, the writing is done, and we have sent the translation into German and French and Italian and Spanish and Japanese and Chinese, every single version, all 300 pages, is getting translated and iterating back and forth and back and forth with the reviewers. This is a lot of file management. This is a huge amount of churn. This is a lot of pages and a lot of words that are going back and forth and back and forth. And this is how we have always done it. And for the most part, this is how translation works today. And then at some point, the reviewers declare it done. They give it their blessing. And then it goes to DTP, to desktop publishing. This is classically how it was done. And every language is laid out in whatever format you've requested. So perhaps you want a PDF at the end, perhaps you want um, something for a tablet at the end. Each and every version for each and every device in each and every language is laid out independently. And the more content that you have, the more you just do this process. And even when I make a change, in a monolithic document, if I add content, if I change content, if I have not somehow chunked up and divided that content, it's just a content blob, as I like to call it, that entire blob gets sent through to translation, even if I've only added a paragraph. And we iterate, and we desktop publish, and it's expensive, and it takes a long time. And there's a lot of file management and file handling that goes on. So what happens in the content blob is that we have a lot of time, which equates to expense, for handling those files. Now, I want to talk just a second about already translated content. So I'm going to discuss translation memory uh, in this presentation uh, in a little bit. Translation memory, just to, to sort of bring it in here for a moment, we're really going to take a deeper dive into it later. Theoretically, if I have translation memory and I'm sending content that is changed through to translation, 
no one should be retranslating what's already been translated. We're not supposed to pay for it. The translators aren't supposed to work on it. The reviewers aren't supposed to review it. Not supposed to happen. But let's think about the reality of this. I've been a writer for more years than I care to admit. And back in the day when I wrote 300 page documents and I would take that document and I would sit it on the chair of a reviewer and I would put a little sticky note and I'd say, only look at page 302. Inevitably, somebody had comments for page 75. It just happened. We would call that quote, opening the book. And I would always tell my customers, we should open the book as infrequently as possible, because even though you think I'm only adding a paragraph on page 325, the truth of the matter is, is that my reviewers all of a sudden decide to go the extra mile and they're gonna be looking at other pages and giving me other changes. The same thing can happen in translation. It is possible for a translator to look at something that's already been translated and say, you know, I think that that's not the best way to say it. I think I'm going to change that translation. And of course, reviewers can do the same thing. You can tell them only look at page 325, but they could go back to page 75 and say, you know what? I don't like the way that's translated. I think we should change it here, there, and everywhere. It is possible to lock the translations that have already been you know, done and approved from before. It is possible to lock down your translations. I suggest you do, but a lot of times we don't have the time because it's, it's a process to lock down all those files. So we need to just be conscious of the fact that one of the dangers of monolithic translation, monolithic content blob translation, is the potential for already translated content to go back through that process. But last and probably most important is the cost of desktop publishing for every version, every device, every language. Desktop publishing costs can be 20, 25, or even 30% of your entire bill, your entire translation bill. And that's a huge amount. And we've, we've heard complaints about it for years and years and years. So instead, let's move to what we really are talking about here, which is a structured environment like Ditta, like Adobe FrameMaker allows you to do. So, you know, at this point, we've, we've all heard it, we all know how it works. Instead of one monolithic content blob, I have different chunks, we'll call them topics. And I create my final asset by pulling in these different topics. And it's possible that maybe, like in this picture, uh, three of those topics are new or changed, but the other five are fine. They, they've been translated, nothing's changed in them, I'm not touching them at all. And they don't go to translation at all. We only send the topics that have changes or are new to translation. This cuts down on the churn in a huge way. Being able to work with a smaller chunk of content is so much more nimble for the entire process. And let's talk about what happens now, because there are a number of things that are different. First of all, uh, the writer is only responsible for writing, you know, those topics or changing those topics. We haven't, quote, opened the monolithic blob. And that topic, those topics go to translation and only those topics go to translation. And really this, this arrow here in between the uh, magnifying glass and the globe, it should be two way because they are gonna iterate. It's going to go faster. It's probably going to be better. I have often found that reviewers uh, can suffer from reviewer fatigue we don't talk about it much, but you know, if you're presented with 300 pages and you're told you need to review it, even if you're only told you need to review from a certain point, there's something about having that huge file sitting in front of you that it's just fatiguing. So it's more nimble, it's faster. 
and I'm only re reviewing translations that are new and changed. And then rather than going to desktop publishing, my final topic in its final language goes into the content management system. There is no desktop publishing involved at this point. So I've taken the text. It's only the new and changed text. I've translated it and I've checked it back into the CMS. Again, translation memory does come into play here. And uh, one, one of my reviewers of this presentation was quite adamant that I really needed to, to have an arrow that goes from the CMS all the way back into the translation process. Because if it's already translated, then it doesn't need to be translated again. So there's less content to handle and manage. It's really hard for me to, to, to explain that um, this makes a big difference in the entire process. You're less likely to change already translated content because you haven't sent it to translation. There's no, if I don't have it, I'm not gonna change it. It saves time, it reduces churn, and it saves money. Just the process of taking your monolithic blob and putting it into structured topics reduces the churn, saves time, and saves money, particularly on desktop publishing. And this is really where we've seen the biggest uh, gains in terms of, of cost savings. So as we already know, in the structured world, my content is completely separate from the format. And when I go to publish, I use a style sheet of some type and I marry my content with the style sheet and I come out on the other end with whatever it was I needed. Maybe it's a PDF, maybe it's a help file, uh, maybe it's who knows what it is. Maybe it's for my iPhone or it's, it's, it's for a tablet. Because I have removed that desktop publishing, from the hands of the translation company, I have saved a lot of time and a lot of money. And just like I can reuse my source content, write once, use many, I can translate once and use many. So I build those other uh, content assets, my French content asset, my Korean content asset, in the very same way then I build my English content assets. Now, I wanna make one caveat here. I had said when I first started that we need to make sure that we think about translation from the beginning. And sometimes when we're setting up our data deployment, when we're building our content models and creating our style sheets, we forget that other languages have other requirements. It's really important that your German style sheet account for the fact that German expands sometimes 30%. I had that happen in this presentation. Later on, I'm gonna show you some German and I had to really play with getting it to fit on my screen because it expands. Same is true for the direction of your text. There are languages where it doesn't go from left to right, it goes from right to left. These things must be considered and must be included from the beginning in order for this to work. And once it does, you're gonna be in really great shape. So that's the structured authoring component, but really to, to make this a ballet, we need to include terminology management and translation memory, and, and let's go and see why. So why manage your terminology? Andrew uh, alluded to this. He talked about having your brand be consistent from content piece to content piece to content piece. Have your customer experience be consistent in terms of tone and in terms of voice. Well, the same thing happens. It's even more important in a structured environment. I really cannot stress this enough. Let's take this little button here, and it's got two little letters on it. It has an O and it has a K. What do we do with that button? We can press OK. We can tap OK. 
we can click OK, we can select OK, we can hit OK, which I don't recommend, but I've seen hit OK. In fact, there's all different things we can do with this button. I can click OK, I can click on OK, I can press on the OK button, I can tap the button, I can, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Here, I've got 18 different ways to say the very same thing. And this is just a simple example because, you know, if one topic says click OK and another topic says select the OK button, your readers will probably not get confused. I will say you're going to pay more for translation because you've just changed what you're saying. I will say, you know, it doesn't really look too good when you're not consistent. It really, if you want to say select OK, say select OK all the time. When you get to other types of content where we're not just saying click OK or select OK, you can really create confusion if you're not consistent in your terminology. So let's take, for example, this animal. We could call this animal by a number of terms in English. We call it a dog, we call it a pooch, we call it canine, a hound, a mutt, a puppy, we call it a Rottweiler. I think it's a Rottweiler. In a structured environment, if you do not use the same words over and over and over again, and you go to take all these topics and you want to put them together and create something that someone can actually understand, you have failed. You have failed in the customer experience and you have failed in translation. Structured authoring requires terminology management. It requires it. It's not a nice to have. It's not a gee whiz, it would be great if we used our trademarks properly. Our legal team would be happy. You don't know who's writing the other topics. For this to work, everybody has to write the same way. You have to use the same words so that when I go and I build my map and I publish something, it actually holds together as one piece, even though it was created from many pieces. So if I'm gonna use dog, I need to walk the dog, I need to feed the dog, I need to brush the dog, I need to train the dog, I need to pet the dog, whatever I'm gonna do, it's the dog. It's not, I'm walking the pooch, I'm training the canine, I'm feeding the puppy, it's always the dog. So in order to do this, we need to have some type of database, some type of terminology management system that will ensure that if I say, walk the hound, I am told as the writer, no, 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 you're not allowed to use the word hound. We all decided to use the word dog. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret. I share this secret often. A lot of my customers spend a huge amount of time creating style guides and terminology lists. Huge amount of time. Money, expense, revisions. Sometimes they even update it a couple times a year. The secret is that nobody reads it. Nobody reads your style guide. No one has the time. No one has, if I can even find a style guide, it's like a needle in a haystack. I need this automated. I need the correct terminology to be pushed to me so that I use those words over and over again. And just like in English, I'm going to manage that terminology. I'm also going to manage it in all of my other languages so that all of those topics, all of those pieces hold together and so that I save money, which I'm gonna to get to next, which is translation memory. So I hope you're starting to see how these things really interact. It's, it's organic, if you will. So let's talk about translation memory because we've seen that it's really important to manage your terminology so that your topics actually make sense when you build something from them. But how does that relate to translation? 
Well, so translation memory is its own database, okay? It's its own database. And it is a database that collects something called a translation unit. A translation unit is a term or a segment, maybe a fragment of a sentence or, or a term, that has two languages, the source language and the target language. So perhaps I have English to French. Perhaps I have English to Spanish. Perhaps I have French to Korean. I mean, the world does not author only in English. We can author in all different languages. But translation memory is the database that saves previously translated units of content. When your topic goes to translation, the first thing that happens is that the translation tool, the, 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 sometimes it's called the CAT tool, a computer assisted translation tool, is going to first go out to your translation memory, out to that database, and say, okay, of the content that I have here in front of me, has any of this already been translated? And if so, then the tools will actually bring up, it will serve the translator that previously translated content. That's what translation memory is, and that's what it does. The theory behind it is that once you have translated something, once you have paid to have something translated, you should never have to pay to have that same thing translated again because it should already be in the translation memory, sometimes called the TM. And as long as you use those very same words, as long as it's always select OK and it's not press on the OK button, it's not click the button, Theoretically, you should never pay to translate it ever again. Now, I need to put a caveat in here for those of you that are in the translation world. In order to pay zero, in order to pay nothing, I have to have what we call an in-context match. It means not only is this sentence exactly the same, but the sentence before it and the sentence after it are exactly the same as well. Because otherwise, if the sentence before and or after are different, the translator still needs to evaluate that content to make sure that it is accurate. The trans previously existing translation is accurate within this new context. But you still pay a whole lot less, even if it's not in context. And again, dog is translated. We use the same words over and over again, and we don't have to pay. So here's where I had quite the uh, alignment event. I'm going to walk the dog in every language. I'm going to feed the dog in every language. I'm going to brush the dog in every language. So Let's see how all of that works together, because now this is where the dance comes in. This is the ballet. This is what I'm trying desperately to get my customers to understand. It's not enough to just structure your content. Because if you don't use the same words, then it's not going to hold together. It's going to be a mess. And if you can use words that are already translated as you're writing. Now you've got the trifecta. Now you've got the dance going. Because my terminology is that, it's that, that glue that's holding everything together. It's making sure that the readability of my source is clear. It's making sure that my translations can be reused. It's how I really save the most money, is to integrate these tools so that they have an ecosystem of their own. So 
we have structured content. We're going to write it once. We're going to use it again and again and again and again. We're going to translate it once. We're going to use it again and again and again and again and again. In order for that to be successful, we're going to say the same thing the same way every time. Every time we say it, we're going to use the same thing the same way every time we say it. And by doing so, the source that we feed in to the translation software will find a match in translation memory. We will use already translated terms. And we will do this as a circle. Because as I feed in new content, hopefully at least my terminology is the same. It's still a dog. I might be training the dog now rather than feeding the dog. So I have a new translation, but it's still the dog. And that gets fed into the TM. And if that English, I'm talking about sourcing in English, but this could be true for any source language. If that English is then served back up to the writer during the writing process, now we have a dance. And now we have saved time, we have saved money, we have improved readability, we have preserved our brand, we've created that exceptional customer experience. But you really need to have all three parts. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Hey, thanks Val for this presentation and thanks for jumping in so quickly and being so flexible. I really appreciate that. And I guess our audience appreciates it as well. I see some people are clapping in the, in the participants list here that we can see internally here. So um, there was a lot of take, but it was excellent, says Richard <laughs> White. And uh, Susanna Richard, Richards had a question. Um, not using synonyms is counterintuitive to some writing models in which repetition is discouraged. Mm -hmm. Is this a marketing model preference? Uh, well, Susanna, you have hit upon a conundrum. And uh, this is a conundrum that customers call me with all the time, particularly in marketing. We have a number of issues with uh, marketing and translation and consistency and cost. Um, marketing content in general, on the whole, is, uh, is more difficult to translate. I'm just going to state that for the record. I, I can't imagine anyone would disagree. Because marketing content is supposed to be emotional. It's supposed to do something. It's supposed to make you laugh. It's supposed to make you want to buy something. It's supposed to be fun. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I've heard it say frequently, it gets boring. It gets boring to write the same thing the same way in marketing. And we do have a conundrum with this. Um, from a translation standpoint, from an understandability standpoint, you're much better off using the same terms over and over again. However, from an emotional standpoint, it can make uh, it can make the translations and, and the source text um, dry. So we need to find the middle ground is what I like to say with this. Um, you, you have to figure out what is your priority. Is your priority uh, complete readability with no question of what someone might be uh, talking about? Uh, is your priority saving money on translation or is your priority being more emotive? So um, you're right that it can be frowned upon to use synonyms in marketing content. And my best advice to customers uh, is to really find that middle ground where, where you haven't gone too far in any direction. And this is why we hire professional people to, to do it and to work on these things. So kind of a wishy-washy answer, but it is a conundrum. It is a conundrum. So, can I say one other thing about marketing uh, terminology that wasn't, wasn't 
part of the yep. question? Absolutely. Okay, so this is another problem that I'm seeing quite a bit now. Um, Andrew alluded to it in his, uh, he actually talked about it in his keynote. Nowadays, we have a different tone of voice when we speak to our customers. Back in the day when I started writing, we had customers. I had information that I needed to impart to my customer. And there was this line that I was the vendor, the supplier, the manufacturer. And on the other side, you were the customer. Today, it's not that way anymore. Today, we don't want customers. We want our customers to be our best friends, our chum, our buddy. I've got this thing on my wrist now, and like every hour it says, let's stroll, let's walk, let's, you know, get moving. This is a problem for translation for many reasons. One reason is that not everybody wants to be your best friend. Not every culture feels that it's appropriate to be spoken to in that voice. The second is that colloquialisms are completely different in different languages. Rise and shine, if my, if my wrist thing here says rise and shine, I understand what that means because I've grown up here and English is my first language, and I understand jargon and idioms. But if I were to translate rise and shine into Chinese, who knows if anybody's going to understand what the heck that means. And in Chinese, they may have their own colloquialism that would be substituted. There's nothing wrong with this except that it's expensive. And you cannot simply take colloquial English and translate it. Sometimes you can't even localize it. You actually have to transcreate it, meaning you have to write that content in that new language. So now, rather than having a translation event, you actually have multiple content development events. So I work with customers a lot on how do we navigate this? What do we do about the fact that there's this mandate to be best friends in the US, but in other countries, I can't be best friends. It would, it would be horrific, horrific. So there are different approaches to take to managing in this. And of course, it's beyond the scope of, of this talk, but I wanted to point it out because it's not just synonyms, it's also colloquialisms. Yeah, well, there's another question um, from Greg Hubbard. Other advice on how to make decisions about acronyms, phrases, uh, about acronyms, phrases use Latin-based letters, A to pillar, for example? No, uh, so, advice or... in general, if you were just seeking my advice, uh, in general, I would say um, completely avoid Latin phrases. It is a best practice to completely avoid Latin phrases. Acronyms are their own special um, special set of, of information. Uh, most companies spell out an acronym the first time and then use the acronym. The problem, of course, is that the acronym is most likely not going to be the same in the new language. What I have found through experience is that Nowadays, most, most people can understand an English acronym. It is a conundrum. In the best of all worlds, you're not even going to use any acronyms because then we always know what we're talking about. Um, but that's, you know, that's, uh, uh, oh, I see. Greg is, is saying not Latin phrases, phrases that use Latin letters as part of their understanding for a car, A pillar, B pillar. Mm. Greg, I don't have an answer for you on this. I don't know the best practice, but I would be more than happy to check with uh, someone on my team who would be able to answer this particular question about um, Latin letters, because clearly that's going to be a special case. My hunch, and it's only a hunch, is that we will leave them. Um, 
and provide the translators with, of course, reference information about it. But I would be happy to find that out and, uh, and get back to you. And if you want to drop me an email, my email address is on the screen because I do not know the answer to that question. So you got me there. Good question. There was a question from Susanna Richards about, um, I was wondering about idiomatic translations for e.g. Um, pulling my leg in English versus pulling my elbow in Spanish. Um, I, I don't really see that this is a, um, a problem. Um, actually, it's a good translation, I would say, if you translate pulling my leg into the Spanish equivalent for uh, a Spanish translation for pulling my elbow. So uh, I think that's fine. Uh, and in marketing context, uh, it's uh, very likely that you have to do that. In technical documentation content is, of course, better to not use such phrases at all. Do you agree with that? Um, now? I definitely, in technical content, we shouldn't be using idioms. They sneak in like you wouldn't believe. In marketing content, um, here again, we have that that conundrum because not all countries. Uh, or languages and cultures have the same equivalents in terms of idioms. So uh, pull, pulling my elbow in Spanish, I have no idea because I'm not from Mexico or Spain and I don't have a cultural understanding as to whether or not a customer would, would look at that and laugh like we laugh when we know that information we're reading is a translation into English by people who don't have English as a first language. Does that then become something that I can make fun of and laugh at? Um, I would, the, the, way, the way I usually approach this type of situation where we really want to have um, uh, idiomatic phraseology in our English is I, treat, I suggest to customers that they treat English idiomatic English, colloquial English, as a translation. That we have our pivot language, which is the language that we actually have as the base for translation, be in uh, standard English, where you wouldn't say, pull my leg. You, I, I have to think about what you would say, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't fool me, or, or something like that. Um, and then we treat idiomatic and, and colloquial English as a translation of the standard English. And I have seen that work successfully because we're providing a standard English that the different translators then can put in the more appropriate types of idioms in the more appropriate places. There was another question, last question about, um, how about across, um, across for patterns, features, e e uh, active noise cancellation once translated localized with really different acronyms. How about acronyms for patterns features? Yeah, so that's for um, example, active noise cancellation. So it's been my experience that once you have something patented, once you have it as a, a trademark, as something that's registered, that in order to retain that trademark, if you have not patented it or trademarked it, in other languages, you need to keep it in the, the legal uh, terminology. So what I have seen is um, we would use active noise canceling, paren ANC, for example, and we would explain what that means in whatever language we were translating into, but because perhaps that that acronym and that phrase is now a legal component, I would need to reuse it. And I would probably put in the translation, you know, this is what it means, uh, make sure I put it in the English so that we can do that. So um, uh, that's what, you know, once we get to that type of thing, we have to watch the legalities. We don't want to violate our own trademarks. Okay, good. Um... There are a couple of more questions coming in. Um, let me do the following. Um, give me a second to paste the link. Uh, it seems uh, there are a lot of questions from people um, and we cannot answer all of them because the, uh, we are running out of time now. I've posted just now a link to Russ Fisher's LinkedIn profile. And um, I suggest 
that you uh, connect with Val on LinkedIn, and there you can continue the discussion with her, and um, she will be uh, happy to connect with you and um, answer your Absolutely. questions. Absolutely. There's, there's my LinkedIn. And... Or for your consulting services. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Yes. And thanks, big, 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 big thank you for, uh, for my side again uh, for the great presentation on the one hand and for being so flexible in jumping in and um, switching this, uh, the slot with um, Charles Cooper. Um, and uh, with this, I stopped the recording of that session. Uh, it will be available on YouTube in a few weeks, uh, end of November. So um, thanks again for everyone who stayed in, uh, who, who was staying in the room and not leaving us um, because of the technical challenges we had with Charles Cooper in the beginning. Uh, we are continuing now with the next session with Charles Cooper. He's back in the room, and uh, it seems uh, the technical issues were so, uh, sorted out. So uh, please stay in the room. We will continue in a few minutes with this session.